Now when we left off, I wanted to map the abortion debate as follows. We have on one hand people who think that abortion is morally permissible, those who think there's nothing really morally wrong with it, uh, and on the other hand, obviously, people who think that abortion is morally wrong. Under the people who think that it's permissible, there's two subcategories. There are the people who say abortion is permissible even if fetuses are persons. So they're going to say, yeah, 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 fetus is a person, but abortion is still okay. And then there are people who say that abortion is permissible specifically because a fetus is not a person. Now, on the other side, people who think that abortion is impermissible, something's morally wrong with it. You have people who say abortion is morally wrong because fetuses are persons. And then you have people who say that abortion is wrong whether you think a fetus is a person or not. Of these four categories in this course, we look at perspectives from Thompson. So Judith Jarvis Thompson represents the first category. She argues that even if we assume fetuses are persons, it still follows that abortion is okay. Next, we're going to be looking at Marianne Warren. She argues that fetuses are not persons, and specifically because they're not persons, that's why abortion is okay. We saw something similar with the Supreme Court. So if you go back to Roe v. Wade, here's what Roe v. Wade says. Uh, Wade argues that the fetus is a person within the language and meaning of the 14th Amendment. If this suggestion of personhood is established, Roe's case, of course, collapses, for the fetus's right to life would then be guaranteed specifically by the 14th Amendment. So the entire case, Roe's entire case, depends on a fetus not being a person. Now looking at the other side of the debate, we have people like Frank Beckwith and Christopher Kayser who argue that fetuses are persons, so we'll be looking at those types of arguments. They think that because fetuses are persons, abortion is immoral. And then lastly, we look at work by Alexander Proust, and he argues that whatever you think about personhood, it's still the case that abortion is wrong. So he thinks you don't even need to, to answer the question of personhood. It doesn't matter if a fetus is a person or not, abortion is still wrong, according to Proust. Now back to Thompson. So Thompson begins by targeting what she thinks is a really common argument that opponents of abortion give. So opponents of abortion reason like this. If fetuses are persons, then abortion is wrong. Fetuses are persons, and so abortion is wrong. Now what Thompson says is opponents of abortion tend to devote a lot of time and energy to defending that second premise. In other words, they spend a lot of time trying to show that fetuses are persons because they just take for granted the idea that if we can show that, if we can show that a fetus is a person, then of course everyone's going to agree abortion is morally wrong. So, with that in mind, Thompson's approach is a little bit different than the standard response. What she does is she says, okay, I'm going to grant that premise two is true. So, we're going to assume that fetuses are persons. Again, that's not to say that's true, it's not to endorse it, but for the sake of argument, Thompson is just telling us, assume that it's true. With that in mind, Thompson thinks that the first premise still fails. So, she's going to try to argue that even if fetuses are persons, abortion is still permissible in at least some cases. So she doesn't think it's permissible in every case whatsoever, but she thinks even if a fetus is a person, abortion is still okay at least some of the time. So when it comes to challenging the first premise of this argument, Thompson's main idea, the central part of her argument, is that having a right to life does not guarantee having a right to be given the use of another person's body even if one needs it for life itself. To defend this view, Thompson appeals to three different analogies. Each of these is supposed to represent pregnancy in some way, and each of them is supposed to show that even if a being has the right to life, that doesn't give them the right to use somebody else's body for survival. Specifically, the three analogies are the violinist analogy, the burglar analogy, and the people seeds analogy. So the violinist analogy goes like this. Imagine this. You wake up in the morning and find yourself back to back in bed with an unconscious violinist, a famous unconscious violinist. He's been found to have a fatal kidney ailment and the Society of Music Lovers has canvassed all the available medical records and found that you alone have the right blood type to help. They have therefore kidnapped you, and last night the violinist's circulatory system was plugged into yours. 
so that your kidneys can be used to extract poisons from his blood as well as your own. The director of the hospital now tells you, Look, we're sorry that the Society of Music Lovers did this to you. We would have never permitted it if we had known, but still, they did it. And the violinist is now plugged into you. To unplug you would be to kill him, but never mind, it's only for nine months, and then he will have recovered from his ailment and can safely be unplugged from you. So Thompson just asks, is it morally obligatory for you to stay attached to the violinist for nine months? Her response is that that would be outrageous. In other words, there's no way in which you should be morally required to stay in this circumstance. Now what's important about this analogy is that the violinist very clearly has a right to life. Nobody disputes that the violinist is a person, and yet our intuitions, Thompson says, seem to be that nobody's going to say that you have to stay hooked up to this violinist. In other words, there's nothing morally wrong with detaching yourself, even though it's going to kill the violinist. Now this is supposed to be like pregnancy. Obviously the violinist is standing in for a fetus, the person in bed who's hooked up to the violinist is standing in for the pregnant person. The key point is that even though the violinist has a right to life, it doesn't entail that they have a right to use somebody else's body. The person who's woken up in this situation never agreed to be in this circumstance. They never agreed to let the violinist use their kidneys uh, or use their body in any way. They just woke up in this situation. So they gave no consent whatsoever to being in this circumstance, and because of that, they're perfectly justified in detaching themselves. Now there are problems for this analogy. People think that it might only work in certain cases, specifically cases of pregnancy that result from involuntary action. Marianne Warren, for example, writes that it's only in the case of pregnancy due to rape that women's situation is adequately analogous to the violinist case. In the normal case, we cannot claim that the woman is in no way responsible for her predicament. If, on the other hand, you're kidnapped by strangers and hooked up to a strange violinist, then you're free of any shred of responsibility for the situation. Only when her pregnancy is a result of involuntary action is a woman clearly just as non-responsible. Hence, the violinist analogy is of much less use to the defender of the woman's right to obtain an abortion. In other words, the violinist case represents a situation where an individual is hooked up against their will, they never made any sort of choice, they never contributed any sort of responsibility to ending up where they are. Because of that, it doesn't apply to most cases of pregnancy, where pregnancy results from a voluntary act. To better illustrate this point, we could revise the case. So, suppose you've got somebody named Steve, and Steve goes to a hotel that's paid for and sponsored by the Society of Music Lovers. Now, when he's checking in, they make sure that he signs a waiver and understands a waiver. The waiver states that if the guest matches the blood type of a famous violinist who needs this blood transfusion, needs to be hooked up, if there's a match, then the guest might wake up hooked up to the violinist. Steve says, yeah, 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 that's fine, signs the waiver, goes, falls asleep in the hotel, and when he wakes up, sure enough, he's attached to the violinist. Does Steve have the right to detach himself now? And it might seem like, no, he knew what he was getting into. He did this willingly. He did it voluntarily. He knew the risk, and he decided that that was okay. So he decided to check into this hotel, even though he knew what the risk was. So he's not in a position where he can unplug himself at this point. Now that would be bad for Thompson, right? Because that shows that in cases of voluntary pregnancy, you don't have the same sort of right to detach that you do in the involuntary case. So again, the violinist case only seems to work when pregnancy results from an involuntary action. If you think that abortion is permissible in more than just the involuntary cases of pregnancy, then the violinist analogy is not enough. You're going to need something more. To be fair to Thompson, she does seem to recognize this. So she asks the question, if a pregnant person voluntarily calls a fetus into existence, how can they now kill it, even in self-defense? So if it was done voluntarily, you can't just unhook yourself from the fetus. 
In other words, she seems to anticipate that people are going to respond to the violinist case by saying, when pregnancy results from a voluntary action, you don't have the same sort of right to detach yourself. You don't have the same sort of right to obtain an abortion as you would in the involuntary case. So regarding that argument, that type of response, Thompson writes, this argument would give the unborn person a right to its mother's body only if pregnancy resulted from a voluntary act undertaken in the full knowledge of the chance a pregnancy might result from it. What Thompson is saying here is the violinist case shows that abortion is permissible when pregnancy results from involuntary action. What it can't do, or what it may not do, is show that abortion is permissible when pregnancy results from a voluntary action. So she's saying, yeah, that, that might be right. But because of that potential limitation, because the violinist case may only represent involuntary pregnancies, Thompson has to develop further arguments. So this is why she gives two more analogies. So she's going to develop the burglar analogy, she's going to develop the people seeds analogy, and those are supposed to show that abortion in the voluntary cases of pregnancy is still okay in at least some cases. Another major criticism of Thompson's violinist case is that she doesn't make a proper distinction between killing and letting die. A common moral distinction is that killing is morally wrong. To, to kill an innocent person, specifically, is a morally bad thing to do. Not a lot of controversy there. But letting somebody die, that's okay in some cases. In the violinist case, suppose you disconnect yourself from the violinist. You should ask, what causes their death? And the answer there is, their underlying kidney disease. You didn't kill them. What killed them was this disease. They already had the disease. They were already dying. In the abortion case, that's not at all how these procedures work. So in the abortion case, there's a direct killing of the fetus. An intentional action is done to end the life of the fetus in many cases. Frank Beckwith, for example, argues that abortion involves the active killing of a human person. Christopher Kayser echoes this same sort of idea, as he says that unplugging suggests that in causing a separation between you and the violinist, you're not doing anything to the bodily integrity of the violinist himself. So you're not assaulting the violinist, you're not harming him by interfering with his bodily integrity at all, whereas in the typical abortion procedure, that is what's happening. So if you grant that a fetus is a person, well, persons have a right to life, but they also have a right to bodily integrity and the typical abortion procedure violates the bodily integrity of the fetus. So there's this disanalogy, there's this important difference in the violinist case and the typical case of abortion. Kayser continues, though, and says, Consider the violinist analogy again, with the unplugging replaced by a means of freeing yourself from the violinist that does impinge on his bodily integrity and induces his death. Imagine, for instance, that you are to separate yourself from the violinist by poisoning him or by putting him through an incredibly powerful suction machine. If we were to separate ourselves from the violinist by any of these means, then things begin to look quite different. We're not simply separating ourselves or cutting a cord that links us to the violinist. Rather, we're doing something to the body of the violinist, who, if he is a person, he has as much a right to bodily integrity as do we. In addition, if such violent means were used, the death of the violinist would not come about because of his own underlying pathology. In these cases, the violinist dies because we, or our agents, not only cause, but also apparently intend his death through the various means. There's a lot to unpack there. What Kayser is saying is there's two really important differences between the violinist case and the typical case of abortion. First, in the typical case of abortion, there's a direct action being taken to end the life of a fetus. In the violinist case, there's no direct action that kills the violinist. Rather, the violinist succumbs to his disease that he already had. The second major difference is that in the violinist case, you don't violate the bodily integrity of the violinist. Their bodily integrity is left intact. All you're doing is detaching yourself from them. In the abortion case, though, bodily integrity of the fetus is violated. So if Kayser is right, then in the typical abortion case, there is direct violence against a fetus's body. And remember, we're talking about Thompson's argument here. So for the sake of argument, we're supposed to suppose that 
fetuses are persons, right? We're just, we're going to assume that's true. So if that's true, they have a right to bodily integrity, and it seems like most abortion techniques violate bodily integrity. Lastly, an important difference between a typical case of pregnancy and the violinist scenario is that a violinist in this scenario is a stranger, right? You don't know them, you've never met them, you have no sort of connection to them, they're not family, nothing like that. Because of that, it's different from the cases of pregnancy, because in cases of pregnancy, there's a paternal sort of obligation or relation at the very least. So people like Kayser and Frank Beckwith will argue that parental obligations matter. So parents have obligations to their offspring. That means there's a special relationship that exists between a biological parent and a fetus that doesn't exist in the violinist case. So the violinist case is not taking into account the fact that there are special relationships in play when it comes to the abortion debate. Now that gets really complicated. We get into questions about parental obligations and special obligations, and so I'm going to spend a lot of the video talking about that. We're going to set that to the side for now. Just to recap, the central part of Thompson's argument is that abortion is permissible even if a fetus is a person because the right to life does not guarantee having a right to use somebody else's body for survival. So in response to arguments that say a fetus is a person, persons have a right to life, and abortion violates that right to life, Thompson is saying it doesn't actually. Uh, it doesn't violate the right to life because the right to life doesn't give you the right to use somebody else's body, specifically for survival or whatever. So abortion doesn't even violate the fetus's right to life. This is something to get really clear on. She doesn't think there's even a clash between a pregnant person's rights and a fetus, in this regard at least. Just because you have the right to life, that doesn't give you the right to use somebody else's body. And Thompson tries to illustrate this by giving three different analogies, specifically the violinist, burglar, and people seeds. Here's the burglar analogy. Suppose the room is stuffy, and I therefore open a window to air it, and a burglar climbs it. It would be absurd to say, ah, he can now stay, she's given him the right to use her house, for she's partially responsible for him being there, having voluntarily done something that enabled him to get in, in the full knowledge that there are such things as burglars, and that burglars burgle. The idea is this. Even though, in this case, somebody does something voluntarily, they open up a window, that doesn't give any person the right to enter the property. The same sort of thing is supposed to apply in pregnancy, where even a voluntary action that leads to pregnancy, that doesn't give the fetus a right to stay. So it's an invader on the property. It's like the burglar entering into a property. It doesn't have a right to stay there, so abortion is permissible in that it removes the intruder, just like you would be permitted to remove the burglar from your house. And again, this applies even in cases where a voluntary action led to the quote-unquote intruder being there. So remember, with the violinist analogy, the big criticism there was that it only applies to cases where pregnancy results from an involuntary act. The burglar analogy is supposed to explain why abortion is okay even when pregnancy results from a voluntary act. And so it's just saying, even if a voluntary action leads to pregnancy, abortion is still okay. Just think about the burglar case. You can throw the burglar out even though your voluntary actions led to them being in the house on the property. There are problems here. So the first one is causation. In the burglar analogy, by opening the window, you don't cause the burglar to appear. The burglar climbs in through the window by their own will. In the pregnancy case, parents cause fetuses to be there. It's their actions that lead to a fetus being present. So there's a causal factor. Opening a window doesn't cause burglars to enter. Pregnancy is caused by a specific type of voluntary action. So here's what Christopher Kayser has to say. Leaving the door unlocked or a window open does not cause the burglar to be in the house. Opening the door or window only removes an obstacle. On the other hand, in the pregnancy case, a man and woman cause a baby or fetus to be where it is even if they tried to prevent it. The idea here is that, again, opening the window doesn't make it the case that a burglar appears. But pregnancy, as a result of voluntary actions, those actions do cause a fetus to exist. This is important, so Patrick Lee argues, because 
We are responsible for the natural and foreseen results of our actions, even if we try to avoid them. Pregnancy is a natural result of certain voluntary actions. Opening a window, there's no natural connection to burglars entering the house. So the two just aren't similar enough for this analogy to work. This is even supported by Mary Ann Warren. So Warren, in the next video, we're going to see is a strong defender of abortion rights. But even she says that in the normal voluntary case of unwanted pregnancy, a woman has, by her own actions, assumed responsibility of the fetus. What Warren is talking about here is if we grant that a fetus is a person, the voluntary action of causing the fetus to exist makes the actor responsible for the well-being of that fetus. Now there's tons of dispute about that, but it's worth noting that even Warren, who supports abortion rights, thinks that if a fetus is a person and you cause them to exist, by your own choice, and you're the only one who can help them, that you have a kind of responsibility to do that, to help them. So in the burglar case, you're not responsible for the burglar being there. The burglar doesn't have the right to stay. You didn't cause them to be there. You can throw them out. But in the pregnancy case, where you do cause the fetus to be there, you don't have the same sort of right to throw them out. You can't kick them off the property because you're what put them there. Again, that's strictly in the voluntary case. What this comes down to is if the critics are right here, if Kayser, Lee, and Warren are right, then if an agent causes a fetus to exist in the full knowledge that it will depend on the agent's own body for survival, then the agent is responsible for its life. This ties in pretty closely with the second major problem for Thompson's argument. Second problem for the burglar analogy is it has to do with parental obligations. It's widely regarded, widely accepted, that parents have a kind of moral responsibility to take care of their children. So we see this, for example, with child support laws that require payments to support children. The idea is you have a special obligation to take care of your offspring. Now, Beckwith adds to this, these laws are grounded in deep moral intuitions. So the laws he's talking about, child support laws, any laws that require parents to take care of their kids. These laws are grounded in deep moral intuitions that ground our notion that parents have a natural, pre-political obligation to care for their child, even if the child's existence was not the result of a conscious plan to bring the child into being. So if a parent has a child that they didn't want, that doesn't change the fact that they can be held responsible for providing for that child, financially and otherwise. Even if you give a child up for adoption, taking care of the child until adoption occurs is something that can be legally required of you. So you can't just abandon infants and say, look, I didn't want the infant, so I, I'm just going to abandon it. Legally, you're not allowed to do that. Tracing this back to the burglar analogy. In the burglar case, you don't have any sort of special obligation to the burglar. The same goes for the violinist case, actually. You don't have a special obligation to the violinist or the burglar. And so it doesn't match up with pregnancy. If we do indeed have special obligations to our offspring. So if we have special obligations to our offspring, then that doesn't get represented appropriately in either the violinist case or the burglar analogy. Now Thompson does anticipate this to some degree. So she writes, men and women both are compelled by law to provide support for their children. She goes on, uh, she says, surely we do not have any special responsibility for a person unless we've assumed it explicitly or implicitly. So what she's saying there is that natural obligations to people don't exist. The only type of obligation that exists whatsoever are the ones you signed up for. You have to agree to take care of somebody in order to be obligated to them. Any type of naturally occurring obligation just doesn't exist. Now Beckwith points out, this isn't an argument. She's not giving reasons for rejecting any special responsibilities for one's offspring. She's just dismissing the concept altogether. So if you go back and read, Thompson doesn't give a reason to think there are no such special responsibilities. We've got a lot of precedent, legally and morally, that suggests parents have a moral obligation to their children. And yet, Thompson is just saying there are no such obligations. So... Really, we want an argument there, right? We want to know why parents don't have these obligations if 
legally and morally people have assumed that these obligations exist in such a widespread way. I'm going to move on from that. I'm happy to discuss that on Canvas. We can keep that going on the discussion, whether or not these natural obligations exist or not. Um, but for the time being, I'm just going to move on to the next problem. So a third problem with the burglar analogy. A burglar intends harm. They're there to steal. That's, that's what they're doing there. A fetus has no such intention. So a burglar's entering the property, trespassing willfully, intentionally, with the intent of harming the property owner. A fetus has no intention of being there and is not intending harm at all because they are not capable of intention. Again, this is another way in which the burglar analogy doesn't represent pregnancy in the right sorts of ways. We might think, yeah, you can kick the burglar off your property because they're doing something bad by being there. But the fetus is not doing something bad simply by existing. It might be an undesirable state of affairs, so the pregnant person might not want to be pregnant, but that doesn't mean the fetus is actually harming or, or intentionally doing anything wrong. A better analogy then, so let's revise the burglar case a little bit. Suppose you open up your window and your neighbor's three-year-old climbs in the window and falls into your house. Right? So now you got this three-year-old in your, in your living room. Do they have the right to stay there? The answer is obviously not. But do you have the right to evict them with deadly force? Do you have the right to throw them off your property in a way that kills them? And the answer there is no, morally or legally. Like, you can't do that, even though it's your property. Just because somebody invades your property, you don't have a legal or moral right to kill them in order to get them off of your property. That means, in this case, the toddler case, it, it's a better representation of pregnancy simply because we have an innocent individual who's shown up on the property with no intention of doing any sort of harm. They're just, they fall in coincidentally, but you can't use deadly force to get them off the property. Looking at Marianne Warren's essay, which we're going to be reading for the next video, she thinks that abortion is permissible, but on this point, she still disagrees with Thompson. So she says, mere ownership does not give me the right to kill innocent people whom I find on my property. And indeed, I'm apt to, to be held responsible if such people injure themselves while on my property. It's equally unclear that I have any moral right to expel an innocent person from my property when I know that doing so will result in his death. The point being, simply because somebody is trespassing on your property, that doesn't give you the right to kill them. In the burglar analogy, could you use deadly force to get the burglar out? of your house? Maybe as a kind of self-defense. They intend you harm, they're stealing from you, they're there to wrong you, and so you're threatened and you throw them out, but that doesn't apply to pregnancy in most cases. So again, the burglar analogy seems to fail because the fetus and the burglar are too different to compare. The burglar is this evildoer, the fetus is an innocent person. You might seem justified in treating wrongdoers, people who are intentionally harming you, differently than people who are not harming you through any intention of their own, didn't choose to be there. The better analogy would be to think not of a burglar trespassing on prop property, but an innocent person like a toddler who doesn't know any better wandering onto your property. And then the question is, can you evict them by using deadly force? And the answer is clearly no. So that seems to be a strike against the morality of abortion. Just to wrap up on the burglar analogy, we've got three problems. The burglar's presence in the house is not caused by opening one's window, whereas in most cases of pregnancy, the fetus's existence is caused by a voluntary action. Secondly, we don't have special obligations or responsibilities to take care of burglars, but parents are widely thought of to have special obligations to take care of their kids. The third is that a burglar is willingly invading one's home, whereas a fetus doesn't do anything willingly. So a fetus is not in utero willingly trying to cause harm, whereas a burglar is on your property trying to cause harm. So even if you have the right to evict the burglar, even with deadly force, it doesn't follow that you have the right to evict an innocent person from your property by using deadly force. So Thompson presents one last analogy in defense of her claim that having a right to life does not give you the right to use somebody else's body as a means of survival. 
and this she calls the people seeds analogy. Suppose it were like this. People seeds drift about in the air like pollen, and if you open your windows, one may drift in and take root in your carpets or upholstery. You don't want children, so you fix up your windows with a fine mesh screen, the very best you can buy. As it happens, however, on very rare occasions, one of these screens is defective, and a seed drifts in and takes root. Does the person plant that now develops have a right to the use of your house? Surely not, despite the fact that you voluntarily opened your windows, you knowingly kept carpets and upholstered furniture, and you knew that screens were sometimes defective. So this is supposed to represent pregnancy where contraception is used. The screen is supposed to represent contraception. You're doing everything you can to avoid pregnancy, but it happens. Sometimes contraception just doesn't work the way it's supposed to. When contraception fails, is it the case that the pregnancy can remain in place? Thompson thinks not. So even in the people seeds case, you can get rid of the people seed. You can kick it out of your house, throw it out of your house. Uh, and the same thing goes for pregnancy. You're not responsible for continuing pregnancy in these cases where contraception has failed. Two problems from the burglar analogy apply just as well to the people seeds analogy, namely causation. So in the people seeds analogy, you don't cause the people seed to be present in your house, whereas with it, when it comes to pregnancy, voluntary action in most cases does lead to pregnancy, does cause pregnancy. So that applies just as well. All the problems that followed from causation with the burglar analogy seem to apply here. Parental obligations are another issue. So if you grant that there are parental obligations to one's offspring, that applies just as much to the case of pregnancy, but with people seeds, it doesn't seem to relate. So you don't have a parental obligation to a people seed. The people seeds analogy does block the third problem that we raised for the burglar analogy. So with the burglar analogy, we said the burglar is intentionally invading one's, you know, your property, whereas a fetus doesn't. In the people seeds analogy, it seems to be a better representation in that the people seed is not intentionally invading your house, just like compared to a fetus doesn't intentionally invade the body of a pregnant person. So in that regard, the people seeds analogy does seem to represent pregnancy better than the burglar analogy. But at the same time, a people seed is a really abstract idea. And so there's some concern here that it's such a strange case, it, it asks a lot of us to think of a people seed as a person, that the worry is the typical reader is not going to be able to think of a people seed as a person. Bernstein and Manada make this same sort of point, arguing that the reader may find it intuitive that you can kill the person plant just because they find it intuitive that the person plant is not really a person with a right to life. By making the analogy so abstract, you're talking about an entity that doesn't exist that we've never heard of before. It's really hard for us to compare a people seed to a fetus. Because of that, it's hard for us to imagine a people seed being a person. That's the very intuition that Thompson is supposed to be pushing to the side. In other words, Thompson's entire argument is supposed to be based around the idea that even if a fetus is a person, abortion is still okay. But this example is so abstract and kind of out there that it doesn't, our intuitions about it, what we think is right and wrong in the people seed case, is not clearly going to be good evidence for what's right and wrong in the case of pregnancy. Okay, so that's about it for Thompson. We talked about her major argument that she thinks abortion is permissible even if the fetus is a person. Her reason for thinking that has to do with a right to life, doesn't give you the right to use somebody else's body, and then she developed three analogies that are supposed to help illustrate that. We looked at the analogies, we looked at the criticisms of them, it's up to you to decide what you think. We're on to Warren now. Warren is going to take the view that if a fetus is a person, abortion is not permissible. So she's kind of aligning with the Supreme Court on this one. But she's going to argue that fetuses are not persons. In fact, they're not even close. So we'll get to that in the next video.